Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second BPCG Gardener's Question Time. Um, just to do a little bit of audio visual kind of housekeeping um, before we get started. Uh, some of you will notice that as you joined the meeting, you are automatically on mute. Uh, every new person that joins from now on will just be on mute just so that they can get their kind of audio visual stuff uh, sorted out um, uh, privately rather than interjecting on the conversation that we're currently having. Um, if you do have a question, um, obviously you can just take yourself off mute if you would like. Um, there is a chat function in Zoom. Uh, you should see a bottom. If you, uh, if you move your mouse cursor around, you'll get a little, um, a little tool, toolbar at the bottom. Uh, so you can open the chat function and you could just ask your question there or at least indicate that you have a question that you would like to ask and then we can take you off mute and put the focus on you. Um, okay, so let's get started. First of all, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you to our experts. Uh, Chris and David and me, maybe, probably not. Um, and thank you to advance, in advance to everyone that's come with a question. Um, let's get started. So let me just see. That's right. Video off, so maybe the audio will work okay now. I'll try again. That does the seem to have improved, yeah. So I live on Palace Road Estate in Streatham Hill, and in February we planted 10 new apple trees on the estate. These were healthy two-year-old trees on a semi-vigorous rootstock and the trees are being watered by a team of residents and I'd like to be able to give these residents some guidance on watering, so how much water the trees need and how often and why. I'm aware that there are various factors affecting how much water young fruit trees need, including the climate, the weather and the ground conditions. And I'm also conscious that there are risks associated with both under and over watering. I've heard various pieces of advice, including soaking the whole mulch area with 20 litres of water a week or a fortnight during spring and summer. And I'd like to ask the panel what your advice is about watering our newly planted trees to ensure that they're getting the best possible start in life in their new home. Uh Chris or David, would, any of you, would either of you like to start? Uh, hang on, the cat has made a comprehensive answer. She to, certainly has, yeah. Uh, which isn't in front of me. You, you think you could bring it up and summarise it for... Yes, I, yeah, I certainly can. The we... cat's answer is beyond my technical understanding of watering. If I have anything to say about watering fruit trees, it is when you plant them, it's really useful to put a root waterer in, a little piece of plastic that you can curl around the root ball which is stopped at the end and perforated all the way up and then you can add 20 litres because you know the volume of uh, the root water. Anyway that's the only thing I've got to say on fruit watering. Okay um, so Kat has actually given an, uh, a very comprehensive answer. It's probably too comprehensive to actually uh, do it all here. Um, so what I will do is I mean obviously I'll summarise it now now um, and then we will uh, this uh, the recording for this um, uh, question time session will go up on YouTube and in the description for the YouTube uh, video I'll include all of Kat's advice on watering so you can always check it there and Catherine I can always get in touch with you and let you know um, uh, and send you the, the, the information privately um, so Kat's main advice is uh, to just bear in mind um, the effect that your sort of, I guess, style of watering or the way you water is going to have um, on the plant. Um, she recommends that um, when watering trees, it's important to give them a sort of a less frequent but really good soaking rather than little and often. Um, she suggests about 20 litres at a time. That sounds like a good amount. Um, and the reason you're doing uh, it less frequently but with uh, a greater quantity of water is to encourage the roots to go down to seek water you know, rather than just... Um, rather than uh, only allowing the water to penetrate the first few centimeters of soil and bringing those roots up closer to the surface as they, as they seek it out, um, you're trying to give you know, a really good dunk um, to encourage your tree to send out roots uh, in the way that you, you, know, the way that you desire. Um, she also points out that to try and gauge how much a tree, uh, how much a tree is going to need, um, she talks about whether or not the tree has kind of become established or not. Um, in this context, established means that the tree has got, you know, it's got an extensive and, and a well-functioning root system. The root system is, you know, is, is, is branching out and doing its job well. 
Um, you can tell when the tree has become established because you'll notice, you know, a genuine spurt of growth. Um, this growth is called extension growth. Uh, you can measure it by looking at the amount of growth between last year's um, growth ring, which is last year's uh, apical bud scar. So you can look beneath that. And this year's apical bud. Um, and when you see that, you know, there's a, there's a real um, amount of growth there, there's a, there's a significant jump up, which normally takes about three years after planting. Um, you can limit, you can lessen off the, the amount of watering that you need to do. But before that has, uh, before the tree has, you know, officially become established, um, infrequent but significant, uh, significant watering. Um, yeah, Cat recommends about 20 litres at a time. Um, I'm just desperately checking to see if she's given an indication as to how frequently, um, but it's really, you do have to play a little bit by ear only because, I mean, the weather outside right now, for example, is fantastic, um, but it has been perhaps unseasonably warm um, for probably a week now. So it's really, you do have to keep an eye on, you know, on and sort of account for dry conditions. Um, obviously, it depends a little bit about the soil type as well. Um, what you think the drainage is. Um, and just because you obviously you have to take steps to uh, avoid the soil becoming waterlogged for you know for long periods um because the tree roots will suffocate uh that's very much a sort of a, a, a decision you're going to have to make in situ based on what you know about um the drainage there that's a, about it i'm afraid in her answer i can't see off the top of my head um an indication as to how frequently and infrequent but heavy uh, heavy dunk is but it's um it's 20 it's at least 20 liters at a time um especially during warm weather uh rather than sort of infrequent uh, rather than more frequent but sort of sprinklings david chris do either of you guys have anything or anyone else on the the uh, uh i think that's a pretty comprehensible I'll answer um in terms of how frequently um it, what depend on the weather. So a cat emphasizes, um, I remember that uh, obviously in the winter you just don't, when the tree is dormant, you don't need to water at all. Um, whereas in the height of the summer, if it's not well established, then it's likely to need um, water reasonably <coughs> frequently. In the height of the summer, weekly, perhaps in the autumn and spring, um, unless you get days of uh, 23, 24 like this, mm. um, by we the, the, every two weeks, every fortnight, they tapering off and building up in the uh, spring and tapering off in the in the winter. Mm. Yeah, I I I'd just say um, uh, I mean look look at the um, leaves and if if it does look like it's struggling, um, uh, give it give it a good water in. Also around the Base. Um, whenever I plant a tree, I make a, as well as what Chris was saying about putting the tube in the ground to make it easy to water. Also, make it um, uh, a little bit, a little bit of a basin around the base, so that when you do water, you know it's going down into the roots and not just running off. Uh, on the, especially when the the soil's dry. Have you got anything to say about um, tree planting? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. We can hear you, oh, you. Oh, good, good, good. I thought I was going down. Yeah, if it's Palace Road Estate, which is very near us, we're on a very heavy clay slope here on this side, and particularly where we are, up in the top of West Norwood, um, you only got to go about four or five centimetres under the ground and you meet a clay pan. Now, Palace Road Estate is the same, I know, because I used to work with a gardening group there. The one thing they need to check is just make sure about what the subsoil's like. If it is heavy clay, the tree is going to have a lot of problems drinking that water because the clay holds on to it. So just check out the subsoil. That should dominate your watering regime to a certain extent anyway. You just need to go to a spade step just to find out what it's like. Okay. Um, Catherine, do you have any, um, any follow-up questions that you'd like to ask us before we move on? I don't have any follow-up questions. Oh, I say that's really helpful. Uh, thank you to everyone who's contributed. Stay with us, Catherine. I'm sure there'll be lots of fun later. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd just like to. Oh, 
trees do seem thriving at the moment. They're already providing the bones for me on leaves and blossoms. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Okay, um, so I think we've actually got a, a, another question from, uh, from an attendee. Uh, Afshin, am I I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Bear with me a moment, I'm just going to take you off mute. Uh, that's right, thank you. Hello, hello everyone. Hi. Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, it's, um, my garden has a large sycamore at the end, which is on a raised kind of um, bed, which is, starts around about half a metre and sort of slopes up to about a metre. I've got a visual, which I'm trying to find out how I can share it. Um, I'm not too sure about how to do that. Um, and let me see. Well, I'll explain it. And then while you guys are answering, maybe I'll try to share the visual. Sure. Um, so, yeah. Very dry underneath. Um, and just wondering what kind of planting, other than sort of ferns, would work under there. And it's quite compacted as well, the soil there. Right. Um, I think so. To be honest, if it's if it's dry shade, I think this is probably a great time for Chris to show off uh, his shady planting wheel. I've got some questions first. Okay, uh, sure. Um, yeah, I'm sort of starting with what Doug was saying about um, uh, about the previous tree. Uh, what's underneath this tree? Um, is that slope doesn't sound natural to me. Do you know what it's made of? It, it could be the spoil of some excavation somewhere. Yeah, we suspect that that's what it was. Um, ah. We've been there for 10, 12 years, um, but it was converted into two flats in the early 80s. And we Did think, you know? also, yeah, we think there's a lot of excavation soil there. The bits of glass and sort of bits and pieces have sort of come up. Uh, yeah, well. correct. Do, 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 do you know if the base of the tree was originally at garden ground level? Have they built up around the trunk, do you think? That's what, it's difficult to tell. Um, the, the, the base of the tree seems to be higher up. It doesn't seem to be on ground level. So it's, a, it's a seedling, perhaps, a sycamore seedling that's taken... They do grow really, really quickly, sycamores. Um, so you think the tree is growing on the surface? Yes, it's it's yeah. uh, um, it's about well, it's reached to the top of the basically the the roof line. So we're a two-story Victorian end of terrace, and it's reached to the top of that. But it's the a good half to two thirds of it is just completely covered by ivy as well. It's con consumed by a giant ivy. Uh, and it's a, a single trunk, is it? Uh, yeah, it's a single trunk, but not a kind of, um, it starts with a single, it sort of branches up into two sort of smaller ones. I'm sorry, actually, I didn't, I missed that. Oh, it starts off as a single trunk and it sort of branches off into a couple of other main stems of that. And it's about, uh, two foot, three, two and a half foot diameter at the bottom. Right, okay. Yeah, well, um, that's, that's going to provide quite a lot of shade. Yeah. Um, I suppose the question is, um, how much value are you going to get out of the, uh, of the site? Um, if it's at the bottom of the garden, then presumably you see it all the time. Um, so it would be good if it looked good consistently is that is that right yes and also sort of um in terms of irrigation it doesn't get obviously because of the canopy in the ivy doesn't get much water and so it's about maintenance as well um i'm quite happy to do guys sort of maintaining other parts of the garden but that bit at the, at the back would be nice if it's sort of fairly low maintenance yeah i i think the the final question is about you know, how dry or moist it is um, if it could be moistened, then you can expand the range of plants that you could you could you could grow in there. I, I, I don't want to suggest something that's going to be very high maintenance action. I, I, I really think that um, you you want something that's that that you can do and that that doesn't need lots and lots of attention all the time. Is is that fair? 
assumption. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I would suggest um, some shrubs. And uh, you, so, Josh, can you share the screen? It, it, you just pop it out of the website. Um, I would suggest some shrubs, and it really depends on you know, whether you think it, it will be possible to moisten it in some way. You've seen our leaky pipe irrigation, have you, in the garden? Uh, yes, I've seen it. Long, Because yeah. I mean, you, know, you you can buy you can buy fifteen meters of leaky pipe at B and Q for nine ninety nine. Um, mm. It's not it's not expensive, and you could just wind some leaky pipe in there and irrigate some of it. Um, and Josh, can you share the screen? Ah, you're on mute. Um, let me see. Oh yes, I can see that. Got it. Up. Right, can can you can you see that? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so if you look in the bottom left corner, um, there are four shrubs there that will grow in more or less total shade um, and don't need a lot of moisture. Viburnum, um, mm. Skimia, Japonica, uh, Fatsia. Um, false castor oil plant and, and Mahonia, which is very welcome in February and March when it bursts into flower. I mean, you could, you could plant, um, depending upon the size of the, um, uh, of the border in question, you could plant one or you could plant little groups of three of those things and build yourself a bank that um, should look good all year. If you wanted to come down uh, at the front, you could plant some of the things on the left of those shrubs. So Alcamilla for the spring, Geranium, Macrorhizum, um, Euphorbia, Amygdaloides, um, or some Dryopteris ferns um, at the front. If you could um, clear some space. I'm a bit worried you're not going to have much um, soil there and you may need to mulch first um, but all of those things should um, live in dry shade. If you were able to irrigate it a bit more then you could move over to the right hand side um, and plant, hey you can even plant a ginger should you want the Hidicium forestii um, yeah. will look lovely there and brilliant white in the September light um, as it uh, as it borders um, out of the as it flowers out of the border, but okay, anyway, which one was that one? Side there, you missed the name. Um, looking at shrubs, um, also the hydrangeas will, if you can moisten them, will do very well in shade. So um, that's that's great. Which one was the white one in the, um, in in September? The, Sorry, which one was the white? Well, well, numbers of these are white. The Hidicium forestii, which is only in the summer, um, that is white. Um, Acanthus spinosus is a sort of whitey green with hints of brighter white. Um, you can get hookahs in whites and telomas in whites, and uh, still be in creams, brunners and cowslips in whites. So you can, you can choose white varieties of, uh, of all of those things. On the other side, obviously, you can get white hillibores. I was planting some of those just uh, on Thursday at the garden. Um, Lily of the Valley snowdrops. Um, you can get white geranium macrorhizum. Um, obviously, the euphorbias are yellow and yellow and yellow. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of white that you can, that you can get there. That's great. Thank you very much. It's great, Afshin. So this is on the website um, in the um, in in the copy of this week's email, which you also got, didn't you? You got the weekly email. So there's a there is a link to this in in the weekly email. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, 
is amongst there are there some grasses as well i, I missed that sorry amongst uh the list on uh, on the slide are there some gr grasses that you would recommend some grasses mm -hmm. did you say afshin sorry yes some grasses yeah there aren't any grasses um I mean, as you probably know from um, you know, just looking at people's lawns, grasses are not generally tremendously successful in, in, in deep shade. There are probably one or two grasses, and I'd have to think about it and dig some out, that, but there are one or two grasses that you could probably try in, in deep shade, but grasses do need a bit more um, light, you know, and that's why you know, grasslands are open um, and receive lots of, lots of sunlight. Um, I'll have a think about some um, some other grasses, Afshin, and uh, perhaps drop you a line. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you very much for the slide, though. It's very useful. Great. I'm going to stop sharing Josh, uh, now. You, yeah, it was you. Okay, great. Yeah, it was me. Yep. So we. Ah, look. Oh, hi, Kate. You've got Kate. Let, let's just take Kate off mute. Right, Kate, you are officially live. Whoa! Hello. Look at that blue sky behind you, amazing. Blue sky, it's boiling. So we've got um, three volunteers here. We're all working at a very safe distance. <laughs> so uh, yeah, demonstrated potting on of tomatoes. Um, I was slightly lower than the audience of Lauren and Laura uh, so that they could see, see my demo. Uh, so we've potted on um, the seedlings to two litre pots. Um, I don't know if you want to see them. Are you happy to be shown? Yes, yeah. please. There's Laura. Can you see her? I'm two metres away. Yep, no. Confirmed human contact. Human being sighted. <laughs> Excellent. And here's Verena. And here's Laura. Uh, Lauren. So, yeah, it's all good. And we and we've distributed most of the fruit. Well, four people have come and picked up their fruit bushes, so that's brilliant. And everyone's extremely excited about um, the idea of being able to pick up other stuff. And they've compared us favorably with certain major seed uh, distributors whose order time is a lot slower and less efficient than ours. So I think we can, you know, smugly pat ourselves on the back there. You heard it Great. here first, folks. Um, four people picking up was one more than I was expecting. <laughs> I think it's four. It may have been three. There were two Jessicas. Anyway, it's fine. They all, um, it's all good. I don't think there's been any fraud. <laughs> can, we have, can we have a look at the Gates border, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, stage left or right as I'm exiting the gates? Stage right, I think, um, well, yeah, unless you've done some stringing or perhaps done some stringing. Depends where the audience is, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, here we are. Uh, you want to see the unplanted, the planted one, right? Yeah. The planted one, yes. Oh. Uh, uh, for those of you who are less technically oriented, I think what you are observing here is the limit of the Wi Fi coverage. Yeah, the, the mistake was asking her to move away from the office and essentially yeah. leave, leave, leave oh, the grounds. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, we must get a, um, a, a, a range extender. Um, so I actually okay, have... Well, uh, okay, back when she wanders back into the garden. Yeah. Um, um, so I actually have a question for the meantime, if that's okay. Uh, just coming off the back of what Afshin said, it sort of, it occurs to me that uh, many people in London are in a similar position to him in that they have moved into houses, perhaps they've been living there for a long time, uh, and in their gardens they have uh, mature trees of which they don't really know the heritage of, they, you know, they haven't planted themselves, they've just kind of always been there. Um, and so I was just going to ask a, a question which is, if you are in that sort of situation and you've got a tree at the end of your garden and it's just kind of there and you're wondering what to do underneath it, or how, should you prune it, first of all? like? is uh, sort of if you if you have kind of adopted a tree um when is should you start thinking about kind of maintaining that tree and sort of keeping it <clears throat> because a lot of people it's a uh, it, they kind of inherit someone else's problem and then it remains kind of someone else's problem for the time that they're living in their 
uh, in their London flat or house. Um, so, but it seems prudent um, to give that tree a little bit of maintenance, perhaps before you even start doing stuff underneath it. So I just wondered if the panel had an opinion on that. Well, um, I mean, you can consider uh, raising the things like raising the crown and thinning the uh, branches to get more light um, around, around the base. Um, that's uh, uh, that can. I, I haven't quite got the gist of this. Are you asking about dead things or what? Uh, so I was just asking about sort of the, the, the very, very fundamentals of tree pruning or trimming, because I suspect that there are plenty of people that have moved into houses and have perhaps been living there for several years um, and have not done anything with the trees. Right, uh, so it's about, about yes. tree pruning. Yeah, um, I just, because perhaps, you know, people that are in a situation like Afshin where they've got a, a mature tree, they've got a space underneath it and they're trying to make some informed decisions about, you know, what to plant there and how to irrigate it, et cetera. Um, but should the first thing that they should is perhaps the first thing they should think about what are they going to do with the tree specifically does the tree need you know does the tree need pruning or trimming does the tree you know something like the crown raising for example and what effect is that going to have uh, on the area that they're going to plant beneath can I suggest hello oh I'm breaking up can you hear me yes yeah. yeah okay yeah i was just going to suggest around in our immediate vicinity we've got a lot of very very tall trees particularly mountain uh, mountain ash and things like that one of the things you need to be aware of in a garden be it small or medium size is not to let the tree get too large for the simple reason that the arboreal costs are incredible we just had a um we just had a couple of trees done in our garden because we had to one of them was an elder and it was growing like a dry <coughs> shrub. And the guy took that down for us. He took the crown, he took it down by uh, two thirds and it's made a lot of difference to light in the garden as well. You got to think of that. Trees can often obscure a garden quite considerably, particularly in London, where you've got gardens bunched together and lots of trees growing in groups. So I would suggest don't let it get too big before you prune it. Otherwise the cost oh. goes up. I think this is really wise advice, Doug, and advice that I regret that we have not followed over the last 20 years in the garden. Um, yeah, and something that I've been discussing with Kat and others. Um, we, when we did the arboricultural survey for the barn, the number of trees that we had on site increased enormously because um, a tree nowadays is anything over 7.5 centimetre girth. Um, and that is reduced from 10. I had thought it was 10, but we suddenly had some, some things that I had intended to cut out, which were suddenly trees and which we needed permission to take out because, of course, we're in a conservation area. So not letting them get too big is the first step to not having a giant in your garden. Now obviously trees are really, really important and we want to have as many of them as we possibly can, but, but their site is important as well. And if we are to have gardens that will be more productive um, in the future, we do need to ensure there's less shade cover. So as David suggested, you can raise the crown um, in a tree to let more light in, um, and you can also thin a uh, mature tree to take some weight off the canopy um, and let more light through the canopy. Um, yeah, I mean, drastic measures. Uh, Doug, you, you said they took a third off or two thirds off, did you? Uh, yes, it, well, it was two thirds off the elder because it had to, because the neighbour was completely screened out. So I said we had to get the guy when he came in with his ladder to go in the neighbor's garden as well. So we yeah. did it because the, we, we talked to the neighbor and he said, yeah, it would be great if you could actually chop it down because our whole side of our house is dark. So it does, you do impact in London, unfortunately, with trees. You haven't got the space to let them just go, really. But you're right, they do need managing, but they are important as well. I mean, just referring to trees in the garden, which we haven't really looked at, behind the lower greenhouse, there is a box elder, um, some sort of maple, 
um, new photos of the garden 20 years ago, that box elder was about five centimeter girth. It's now about um, 25 centimeter girth. And we've just not really considered whether we want a tree just behind the lower greenhouse. Um, the um, sycamores that are going to have to be removed um, in order to provide the new entrance to the classroom. So they are behind the shed and the, and the old apiary. And those, again, 20 years ago, were only about 15 feet high, and they're now 45. And, and it's just, and nobody intended there to be a sycamore there, um, but we've just not paid attention to it. And um, you know, just paying attention to things that will become trees or are getting big is really, really important. Yeah, I think if you're, if, I mean, if, you, if you've just moved into a new place and you were planning on remaining there for some time, it's, I think it's very easy to sort of to look at the, the trees that are established in your garden and think that is either not a problem or it is a problem for a long way down the line. Um, but you may end up in a situation similar to Doug's where if you leave it for a really long time, it does become a genuine problem and then you have to take comparatively drastic action. I think it's probably worth saying at this point as well that uh, mature trees are, are not always to be just messed with lightly, um, especially if it's, a, if it's a large mature tree, it's worth checking with the council to see if there is a tree protection order for it. Um, and obviously trees are pretty high, climbing up there and chopping things off is quite, it can be a dangerous activity. So beyond a certain, beyond a certain height and beyond a certain level of maturity, it's probably worth consulting with a, a professional um, arboralist rather than climbing up there with no safety gear and doing it yourself. Definitely not. No. <laughs> Right. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we're going to get Kate back anytime soon. Well, Kate, Kate is here, but on audio. I'm going to unmute her and see if anything happens. Okay. I wonder Thank if you. her presence is just vestigial. No, I can hear something. Oh, it's bird song. How lovely. Hey, we didn't hear that. Can you hear us? No, I, can, I can hear. Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Would hello, you like hello. to come back? Would you like to come back on video and see if you oh, can? Yeah, sorry about that. I, I can show you the border. Can you hear me? We yeah, can hear we, you. Yeah. We think that you're reaching the end of the network. No, That's no, we're not. It's all right. It's a technical problem. I think I've solved it. Okay. Uh, so, in fact, it's really handy you're here because my instructions that at least as I understood them was that I was just, we were just gonna do horizontal lines, but we think it would be more helpful to get meter square. Is that correct? Verena is just about to start doing it. Well, the, the horizontal lines are the most important. If there is time and string, then, then two meter lines first. And if there's even more string, one meter line, you know, so you go in between the two meter lines. Okay, so uh, we think we have a, so we are doing one meter, we were doing one meter horizontals. Yes, one meter horizontals. And, and then, yeah, and then we can create two meter, I see what you mean. If we have enough, go for one meter, but initially just create one by two meter squares. Yeah, exactly. Go horizontal, one meter, one meter, then try two, and then if you have enough, you can cut the two by ones, <laughs> or one by ones. Know that. Yeah. What? You're not on video. Will you switch your video on? Oh, do you want to be on video? Yeah, yeah I, want to sure. video. I want to see what you're doing. How many participants are in our group? How many what? Uh, it's 11, including How many the panel, people Kate? are listening? 11, including Oh my the God, panel. let's not spend too long on this then. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Great. I would like to point out that this Sorry, kind of live gardening is something you don't even get on BBC Gardener's Question Time. So. Not that we're competitive or anything. Oh. Something is about to happen. Right, I'm, I'm lost. What are we waiting for? We're waiting to see if Kate's uh, video feed goes on. Here we go. Ah, here we go. Great. Ah. 
So Verena is doing, is as you can see, creating a lovely luminescent green grid, which we will plant to tomorrow. I say we, as in we, the charity, will plant to tomorrow. As in me? Well, the access is out. <laughs> so we're planting this grid, according to Maya Beresford, who's a garden volunteer garden designer. Well, she's a paid garden designer, but she's volunteering very kindly, volunteering with us to create this, um, hopefully what is going to be a really beautiful border. And we've, we have um, plants that we were funded by the Western Riverside Environmental Fund to purchase and create what we are calling rather grandly the welcome borders. Um, so, so here's the initial, the soil's been prepared. I, just before, just, be, just sorry to interrupt Kate, but I wonder if perhaps yeah. the, which camera on your phone you're using, because at the moment we are getting a very darling view of your upper cheek and the side of your glasses. <laughs> which I am very much appreciating, yeah. but it's there we go. That's much better, yeah. Are you seeing Verena now? Yes, yes. now we, yes, we can see the yeah. whole site. Okay, so um, yeah, let me explain what's going on here. Um, we've got a lovely design, which um, we might even be able to share. Josh, do you think you could, um, oh no, I, I don't think you've the current one, but anyway. We might so at, the, at the moment I'm spotlighting um, um, Kate's screen. There are lots and lots of plants to go in. <laughs> but uh, I've got a an A4 copy of the plan, and um, it's not altogether clear on the A4 copy of the plan exactly where things go. So I've drawn a one meter grid on my copy of the plan, um, and they're now copying this grid onto the ground, and then I'll be able to lay the plants out in their appropriate square. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. And mm. what sort of uh, what sort of stuff do we have going in here, Chris? Um, I'll see if I can find the, uh, the the list for you. Hold on. I can also sh show you the. We can certainly share the list, and I yes. can show you the physical plants. Let's um, do that. This is the. Here we have some of the plants already planted up in the other welcome border. So you've got um, abelia, hellebores. Kate, could, I saw a label there. Could, could you take it off, please? A what? Oh. A label. Yeah, uh, label plants get nicked. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it off. Yeah, yeah. Label plants get nicked. There you go. That's a gardening tip for everyone. Uh, everyone on the stream. <laughs> So, and we're, um, we'll be mulching as well. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, Kate. Um, I think we've got another question coming from someone on the stream. So we will say thanks. goodbye for now. Yeah, I think I'll um, close it off so that um, we don't have to stress. Goodbye, thank all right, you. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Don't, forget your sun, don't forget your sun cream. I've got it on already. Oh yeah, of course I'm right. It's just me that keeps getting sunburned. <laughs> right, so we will say goodbye to Kate and I will stop uh, spotlighting her screen. Oh, well, that was very God, of course, it's so modern. <laughs> Excellent. Um, oh, so we'll have a quick look at this. Uh, we'll have a look at a quick look at the planting diagram for the beds and then we'll go move on to our next question. So Chris, could you talk us through this? Uh, yes. Um, so you can all see this is the right hand border which they were stringing out um, in, the, uh, in the previous video. So you can see, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, all, all the favourites really. Um, two lovely big clumps of uh, helenium, um, which are going to be brilliant. Uh, two different types of persicaria, um, both our own darker one and um, a, a lighter one chosen by Maya. Uh, verbena hastata, which is going to be um, really, really lovely. 
um, echinaceas, um, which uh, cone flowers, which are going to be great, um, and more white helibores. Um, I have to say that I'm cutting the flowers off the helibores um, before we're planting them out for the same reason that I asked Kate to um, take off the labels. We do find that flowering plants and plants with labels do tend to be half hitched whilst they're, when they are just planted because they're so easy to just pull out in their pot shape. Um, but I'm hopeful that if we take the labels and flowers off we'll be fine. So we're really looking forward to this coming on um, and uh, we'll be putting the majority of those plants in tomorrow. So I, th I think for, um, not necessarily for a novice gardener, but for someone that perhaps hasn't used a planting diagram like this before, this probably looks quite intimidating, partly just because of, I think, just the sheer number of, of plants that are going in. Could you just quickly give us a, so when you were coming up with this planting diagram, what were the sort of the very fundamental things that you were thinking of in terms of making plant choices? Okay. Just so. This, this is not my design. Right. This is Maya Beresford's design. Uh, Maya's been a volunteer for really quite a long time. She was a participant in the border workshop um, at the time when we made the Udolf border, and she was also at that time at Capel Manor. Uh, when she left Capel, she went to work for Andy Burnham in Brighton. Um, so for those of you who don't know Andy Burnham, he won the uh, Best in Show Garden last year at Chelsea. Um, and the feature plant was uh, some of our lovely dinosaur food. So um, that was nice. Um, I drafted the brief for this order um, in consultation with Kate and with Kat and uh, at a wider volunteer meeting. Um, and um, Kate is right. Well, what the, what the brief said was that this needed to be welcoming. It is a statement of um, the, um, the joy, creativity, um, and horticultural um, ecstasy, if you will, that, uh, that, that can be found at um, a Brock Park Community Greenhouses. So Maya came up with this scheme, um, and you can see that she's chosen plants that we know quite well, um, but also um, mixed them with things that we don't know so well. Um, and um, yeah, I agree, it does look complex. And indeed, it did take me, uh, working on my own, of course, um, all morning to lay out the left-hand side. It, getting it right is, um, is hard, and I would much rather that we had Maya to do this, but Maya is in Westminster and, um, and not really available to, uh, to, to come for the moment. She's working during the week. Um, she's not really available to come at the weekend. Um, but this is a pretty standard sort of design um, in terms of how it's presented that you would get if you um, hired a, um, a landscape gardener at home. Um, and um, I mean, Maya spent oh, probably three months just thinking about it and observing it in um, different um, times of the year, thinking about the context of it, until she came up with uh, uh, with this design. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, there's been there have been some last minute iterations. So this is the third version of the final design um, that we've had in the last um, five days or so. But uh, I think this is stable now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, it's what you would expect if you hired a professional garden designer. Excellent. Okay, uh, Chris, if you would if you would mind um, just quitting your screen share, just so I can see the question. Yeah, I'm just by a member of the audience. Has that done it? Uh, no, we're. I mean, I I can still see it, but um, right. So we have a question from oh, Amy. There we, there we go. Fantastic. Um, I have a holly bush which is about eighteen years old and has grown incredibly high. It's about 10 foot tall now. I would like to trim it down a couple of feet. 
what is the best time of year to cut the top off, to give it a good old haircut? Right. Um, anyone else on the panel want to jump in on this before? I am, I have to say, Ilex Aquifolium, I'm not a huge fan of holly bushes, uh, just because doing stuff like this, when they've, when they've really run wild uh, for a long period of time, they can be pretty unruly and recalcitrant and trying to get them back to uh, a pleasant size and shape and a manageable size and shape um, can sometimes be uh, a little bit of work because, I mean, holly is a tree. Um, it's grown as a bush, um, but you will, if it's left unmolested for a really long time, it kind of turns back into a tree if it's given... Uh, too much uh too much leeway um and then you've got a similar question to the ones we were talking about uh the uh the issue that we were talking about before um not in the summer is probably the the initial answer for this um but for if it's the kind of holly bush that i suspect that it's really starting to to get away from you when you can find the time to do it realistically um i suspect that even a like it's 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 going to look a little bit um it is going to look a little bit ragged for a, for a while um regular maintenance and pruning of bushes to give them a kind of a fulsome effect and make sure that they've got a, a sort of a wide distribution of leaves that only works or at least it works particularly well if you do that with some regularity um, the, the bush is not going to react in the same way to, you know, getting a, a chainsaw or a head stream and going and chopping off uh, the top. It's going to take some time to recover from that, regardless of what time of year you do it. Um, does anyone have a hot, does anyone in the panel, do they have a holly bush in their garden that they have any experience with? Yeah, we've got a couple. Um, the only thing you don't want to do with holly, if you mechanically strim, if you mechanically cut it, you strip all the bark off of the stems and that can cause dieback. I would say do it by hand. It's a lot more fiddly doing it by hand. But if, you, if it's never been done before, then take it at 10% at a time. Don't go at it too hard because it will die back. Because the further you go back into the holly bush, the less leaves you get, the less density you get. Because obviously the density inside has disappeared. So do it over a couple of years. And as you say, don't do it in the summer really. Yeah, I missed the beginning of this. Um, it, it, is this a standard we're talking about, or is it a bush? It's a bush, as far as it's we know from the from the question. Um, it's just a very mature and somewhat unruly at this point bush. Yeah. Um, so I think I think Doug's right. I mean, really, little by little, ten percent of the year. But I mean, my suggestion would be to take out complete stems if it's a bush right to the base um and you know if it if, if you haven't got 10 of those then only take one off in the year um but rather than chopping the top off i would reduce the density of the bush um and um and, and then when you've got less density then you can begin to take take the top off after that Uh, in my experience, when um, so my brother's got a similar situation that he's kind of battling with at the moment, um, these holly bushes they tend to sort of send out sort of very straight vertical shoots. It's it's almost as if the the um, it's almost as if the tree has been you know it's a tree that's been pollarded and then suddenly you know when it's given time it suddenly starts shooting for the sky. So you can uh, you know once you follow the advice of the panel and try to to, to um, to, yeah, to thin um, out you can kind of you can really do it one at a time right you can look at these the series of stems that it's sent straight up and you can go right let's take this one off yeah, I, and see I, how I, it i do that I, I i take take those out as they develop really um, in, in the year when when they, because they're very very strong those new um verticals and they're, they're not really part of the bush so um just take them out it is going to get I mean, this is a, an unavoidable side effect, but it is going to get a little bit meaner if you do it, because the more you chop into a holly bush, the spikier they tend to get. Um, Ilex aquifolium that is grown 
sort of you know from seed and has been completely unmolested sometimes the leaves are even quite smooth they're not the sort of the traditional christmas card uh spiky holly shape but it, it'll actually react to how sort of dangerous it perceives its environment to be so it's going to get even if you give it a real savage haircut it's going to get a lot spikier as well um which means you probably will have to uh sort of start looking to the maintenance a little bit more because i like to walk around barefoot in my garden but i do not like to walk across old holly leaves which seem to keep their structural integrity for a really really long time um, and are still very painful to stand on even months or years after they've been dropped to the ground okay um uh, so we've got a, just under 10 minutes left to to go on this slot so i think this is this is a good opportunity to ask if there's anyone else um who's watching at home that has a question uh just drop that in the chat um, and in the meantime, while that's happening, uh, Chris, I wonder if you could just give us a kind of a, a, a final general update about what is happening at BPCG. Yeah, at, sure. At um, time. It's been a lovely week. Um, um, there have been the volunteer slots um, for a day um, in the morning and for a day in the afternoon have been full, completely full. Um, we're doing okay. Uh, there's quite a lot of hangover work um, which should have been completed by now, which is not because um, obviously volunteering hasn't been quite what it should normally have been. Um, but the trench for the supply of electricity to the lower greenhouse is now complete. Um, and Michael, the electrician, is coming on Tuesday with his safe, crack safe cracking drill to drill through the wall. Um, so that we can connect up to the trench all the way up to behind the kitchen where the electricity supply is. Um, uh, so I'm amazed that we've done such a great trench. Um, David, uh, was it your specification this? Um, um, yeah, well, Michael's specified what he wants. And I think on um, when he comes next week, he's he's talking about bringing his sister who does weightlifting to help him because the <laughs> cable the cable that is very heavy it's a heavy very heavy reel of cable and it's very um hard hard to kind of uh, uh manage on your own i think where was his sister when we were digging the trench though we could have used her then as well, <laughs> well the, trench I, I, a, I, <laughs> the trench is seven, 75 centimeters deep Yes, 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 75 yes. centimetres, yeah. So we've got a 75 centimetre deep trench, which is 25 wide. And it's perfect. It's lovely. Um, uh, we're about to line it with sand. Um, I think that might be happening today, actually. Um, and um, so that's going on. Uh, meanwhile, uh, as you saw, we've been planting the gate borders. That's, um, that, that has been... Um, uh, taking quite a lot of time. Um, that was part of our team yesterday afternoon. Um, today, I believe Kate is potting on 80 tomatoes. Um, there are loads of tomatoes already potted on. And the news is that they're budding. Some of the earliest ones are budding now, and we're going to be able to get tomatoes into the sales operation, provided we can uh, find a good way of delivering them to the, the delivering orders to the right people, as it were, at, at the front gate. Um, the garden's looking lovely. Um, the woodland in particular is looking absolutely beautiful. And uh, I forgot to do it on Thursday, but I'll send on Sunday a copy of the um, uh, blossoming uh, quince tree, uh, which, is, um, which is great, but the the whole of the, uh, the forest is looking good and the fern bank is also looking good. We're making reasonable progress planting out vegetables, uh, more brassicas to go out. I'm not sure if those are going out today, possibly on Sunday as well. Um, but there is still lots to do. As you know, this is the busiest time of the year. Um, just got to get everything in and, um, and, and going. Um, and so, um, there's uh, there's still plenty to do next week and the week after and the week after that. Okay, um, it's probably worth reminding that that I mean there there are still volunteer. Uh, there still is a structure and a framework for safe volunteering at BPCG. Um, if you are signed up to the mailing list, which I expect most of the people watching are, 
uh, then th there will be information in the weekly emails. There are a couple of slots uh, per day and a, a limited number of volunteers can be present during those slots. Um, as Chris was saying, it is you know the busiest time of year. Um, with that said as well, I think just as we come to the end of this session, it's probably worth uh, just, I think, just plugging this gardener's question time as well. It is the busiest time of year. Um, and if it looks as it seems increasingly likely that the lockdown period is going to be extended, uh, lots of people have a lot more free time to get outside in their gardens if they're lucky enough to have their own space. Um, so please do, you know, if, they, if you uh, uh, encounter anybody that's got any questions, please, you know, you could direct them here. Um, it's also worth saying that we are a, you know, Brockwell Park community greenhouses. We are a community um, and that is uh, uh, an aspect which unfortunately is is likely, you know, is, is always going to suffer when we're living under conditions um, and interesting times such as these. So spaces like this, like this gardener's mm. question time, are a good place um, to kind of to, you know, to simulate and rejuvenate that kind of community aspect. Um, you don't have to come here with a question. You don't necessarily have to come here, you know, with, you know, some deep need for immediate gardening knowledge. Uh, it's just a good place for, um, for volunteers and especially volunteers that are missing the opportunity um, to, you know, to, to come down and, and make the most of the community aspect of BPCG, you could come here instead. Um, yeah, that's everything that I have to say about that. So unless we have anything further from the panel or if any uh, last minute questions from people at home, uh, perhaps we'll draw this to a close with, or oh, I'm cheating you out of two minutes. I do apologize, but um, yeah, perhaps it's time to draw us to a close unless we've got anything from anybody else. No answer was the loud reply. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Ah, cause I've got problems. I just wanted to say something just as a little, um, uh, add on to that. I've been in contact with about five or six of the main seed suppliers trying to get a few seeds. And for the first time in my life, they're actually saying they've run out of vegetable seeds. Yeah. Mm. Really, I mean, everybody in my area is planting stuff. They've got people planting cabbages and flower pots and everything like that. I've been on, I'm doing a lot of growing for people in my greenhouse. I'm also getting a lot of questions from local people about how they can prepare their soil just to grow a few lettuces and stuff. I think it would be a good idea to put something on the website saying, grab a bit of land now and grow a few things in it. You know, everybody's doing it at the moment. And it's the first time I've ever known the seed suppliers run out of seed. Even the bulk suppliers can't supply them anymore because they've run out as well. So everybody's at it now for the first time. That's great, Doug. Um, you'll be interested to know that um, our web traffic plummeted over the last um, three to four weeks. And that's because about half of our web tra traffic is people buying tickets for events, but we haven't had any events to sell tickets for. But this week, um, the web traffic has gone back up again to what it was a month ago. Um, we've seen a steady increase since Tuesday, uh, following Wednesday with the weekly emails on, and there's lots and lots of use of the, um, the, the, the website. If, if, you've, if, if you'd like to write that down, Doug, you know, just to write a little article and so on, I'm encouraging loads of people to contribute content to the website. And you'll have seen this week that Kat and David did a fruit, um, mm -hmm. a, a fruit article. Um, so if you could if you could write a little article and send it to me, I'll publish it on the website. Doug. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. So uh, a a good point to leave it on in that case is uh, so Chris, Kate, and I have been um, have discussed sort of bringing kind of features to this particular forum. Um, so if you are you know um, if you're watching at home, if you are one of these people that's taking this opportunity to um, to uh you know to, to plant out a new piece of ground and really make the most of it um rather than having to do the sort of i'm going to wander with my phone and let's test the limit of my wi-fi sort of thing there's always an opportunity to record stuff in advance if you have questions if you've just got stuff that you would like to show off right things that you are doing uh 
uh, that you haven't done before that you're particularly proud of, then you can always display them on this forum as well. Um, and even though things like story stompers, those kind of workshops and stuff are, you know, uh, are things that you, we can't attend in person, um, there is now a BPCG YouTube channel where this video will be uploaded, um, but there's content being produced on there as well. Um, so our sort of digital footprint is, is ever widening. Um, so there is still plenty of stuff to, to do and plenty of reasons to visit the website, even if you are not going to, you know, create your own stuff or um, your own content for submission. Okay, brilliant. Mm. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it is another lovely day outside. So if you are lucky enough to have some outside space, uh, I hope you get out there and, and make the most of it. Um, and we will be back same time next week, 11am next Saturday morning. All right. Thank you, everybody. Mm. Yeah, goodbye.